Shalom, welcome to the Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon with the Chabad House of Delmar, together with my co-host Mark Rohn at just statewide news service.com and jvistechnology.com. Okay, close enough. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Rabbi. Stay well, wide news service. Well, we have a, um, a very special guest with us, a uh, returning guest, uh, right. one of my favorite assemblymen, uh, David Weprin, and from Queens, Holliswood, and welcome to the Jewish View. Welcome back. Thank you, Mark. It's, it's always a pleasure to, to be to, here with you. It's good to see you How again. How many years have it been? We've been that a I've been in the Assembly? Together. Yeah. Well, I've been in the Assembly five years, but I was in the New York City Council for eight years, and uh, I went to uh, college up here, uh, graduated in 1977 from SUNY Albany when I was very involved uh, with Rabbi uh, Yisrael Rubin at the Chabad House, which started uh, during my tenure uh, as a student um, at at SUNY Albany, mm -hmm. and I served in uh, Governor Mario Cuomo's administration, uh, Oliver Shalom, mm -hmm. uh, a, a great loss uh, to our uh, state and country, uh, his passing uh, just uh, a month or so ago. And um, I served in his administration from 1983 to 1987, so I spent a lot of time up uh, in the Albany area during those, those years. Well, have you been to our new kosher restaurant? Uh, did you uh, know I have had not. Okay. Uh, I, uh, I'm embarrassed to say I haven't. I, uh, I definitely plan on getting there uh, this session, but well, we, hmm. we haven't been up to here that much, and I haven't had a chance to go yet. Well, well I'll have to take you and sh introduce you and show you around. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Uh, it's a very good restaurant. It's vegetarian, vegan, uh, under the under the Vada Kashrut, and it's Kol of Israel, and it's a lot of uh, an Indian twist to the food. You know. Oh, great! So it's it well, I have a very large Indian population in my assembly district. That's right. So, it's, uh, so that's there you go, Indian kosher. There you go. Um, I was wondering if you uh, what your thoughts are about this education investment tax credit, this EITC. Uh, I presume based on what I heard this afternoon, that you were in favor of this? Yes, I'm, I'm a co-sponsor of the bill. Yeah. Um, I am in favor of it. Um, you know, I think it, um, I, I think, I know a lot of people think the opposition is, is coming strongly from the UFT, but I don't think it's... Um, and New York State United Teachers. And New York State United Teachers, which is, you know, part of the, uh, you know, the, the teachers' union. Right. But I don't think, um, you know, they should fear it, uh, you know, the way they, they have. I mean, I support my public schools very strongly. You know, I think it's very important that we have a sound uh, public education and we have the, uh, the resources. Uh, but this is basically, um, you know, just being able to contribute, uh, you know, to various schools and, and get a tax credit. Uh, the original tax credit was 100%. Uh, I think the, uh, the revised version uh, that's proposed in the budget is 75%. Uh, you get a 75% uh, tax deduction, uh, tax credit, which is better than a deduction because it's actually mm -hmm. uh, you know, dollar for dollar, uh, you know, 75 cents on, on, the, on the dollar. Uh, so I think it'll benefit um, yeshivas, but I think it also potentially could benefit uh, certain public schools as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no reason why uh, people can't make contributions to their favorite public school and get uh, right. that now, tax credit. And this isn't as bizarre as naming rights, like you wouldn't have the David Weprin public school or something. You know, it's not something that if you contributed a million dollars that it would come to that. You know, because you wouldn't have that much of a tax. There's a cap to the tax that, that Correct. credit. Yeah. What would, would be the chances of it passing now? I mean, it's kind of ongoing. I mean, every year. Well, well the total, the proposal in. now, and it's it's much discussion in in my Democratic conference because uh, philosophically, uh, we don't like the idea. Uh, we being legislators, and and certainly the Democrats in the Assembly, don't like the idea of the governor putting in a lot of what should be uh, legislative proposals that should be oh. discussed and debated, not, not specifically this one, but there are many, many other uh, policy. Uh, policy issues mm -hmm. that are part of the budget, and they're really not uh, budget related, so there's a question whether they should even be uh, considered in this process. Uh, having said that, um, it probably uh, the best chance it has to pass is probably if it is part of the budget, because people generally vote for the budget as a whole. But, and, what, uh, and, and what do you think of the coupling it with the DREAM Act, which has to deal with illegal immigrants? But I was just wondering, you know, you support both, I think. I do. I you do. Know, I support so, the yeah, DREAM Act. Because you have such a diverse population in your district you know, who would be political suicide. Well, no, I'm very, uh, you know, I, <laughs> no, I'm very, well, I think it's the right thing to do anyway, yeah. but I have a very uh, diverse, my uh, Queens County in general uh, has over 200 countries of origin, right. uh, immigrants from 200 different countries and languages and dialects. Uh, my district is very diverse. I have uh, 
a large South Asian population. I have a large Latino population. Mm -hmm. I have uh, an Asian population. Right. So it's it, it's very diverse. People from uh, from India, from Bangladesh, uh, from China, from Korea, mm -hmm. uh, and from many Latino countries. Well, you know, so you know, here you are. You can support both. So you probably don't mind the coupling because you're. You're supportive of both, but what do you think? In this case, just, that is true. Well, what do you think of just the idea of coupling? Is it strong arming, you know, because the Senate Republicans wouldn't support the DREAM Act, but they support EITC? The Democrats in the past in the Assembly haven't supported EITC, but they support the DREAM Act. I mean, is this a good way to? This is how, <laughs> pardon me for saying this sausage is made, but have you, you know, uh, do, do you like these types of things? In well, generally, in a pure world, yeah. um, it's better to have it separated, to have it as part of the legislative process and have hearings and have debate the issues on the merits. But uh, as a practicality, I mean, Congress has been attaching, uh, you know, uh, amendments to different uh, appropriation bills for years, and, and that's uh, very often what happened in Congress is you'd attach something to another bill and, and that's the way to, you know, to get it passed. So uh, uh, we'll see. In this particular case, uh, I don't have be a problem because I do support right. both of them. But just because it's done in Congress and it may be bad politics and, or bad policy in Congress doesn't mean we should copy bad policy. So I'm just wondering if that's something that maybe it should, well, each of them should stand on their own. Uh, well, you know, uh, I think the problem is that the DREAM Act has been around for a number of years and uh, it hasn't passed in the Senate. Uh, the education tax credit has been around a number of years, hasn't passed in our House. Uh, so this, you know, might be the way to get, uh, to get both of them passed or, as part of a compromise. Or both just fail and don't come to any conclusion. Well, you know, some it, people have speculated that's what the governor, that was one of the scenarios well, the governor came up with. You know. Well, uh, well, the DREAM Act has been, uh, you know, passed in our House yes. and, and actually had a vote in the Senate and failed in the Senate. So it, it has been out there. Oh, yes. So, okay. Maybe it won't, may, maybe by coupling them, maybe both of them will fail. Well, not if it's part of the budget. Generally, you vote for the budget as a whole. So if it's part of the budget, you know, that's a way to, you know, to get it, uh, get them both uh, passed uh, as part of the overall budget. Uh, and you were on the fin chair of the finance committee in the city council. I was, and, and so. now, I'm on, uh, now I'm on the Ways and Means Committee right. uh, in the Assembly. And it's, and with so, being such a new legislator compared to every, you know, others, I mean, that's pretty impressive that you're on the Ways and Means Committee. It's, uh, it's you know. Well, it's the first year I, I got on uh, yeah. the Ways and Means, so, um, you know, pretty I'm impressive. here five years. Yeah, I'm one of the more junior members. It's mm -hmm. mostly senior members in the And that's House. probably because of your experience as chair of finance in New York City Council. That was my argument uh, why I should be appointed, yes. <laughs> so do you think that, what do you think of the new speaker, Carl Hasty? Do you think he'll be good for the Jewish community? Uh, I do, I do. He has very strong ties uh, to the Jewish community in the Bronx, where he's the, uh, the Bronx uh, Democratic chair. No, uh, or about to be former, because he yeah, said he would give it up. No, but he, <laughs> where he was. Uh, he's done a number of JCR trips to Israel uh, that I know of. He's told me about them. and. Uh, you know, I think, um, you know, he'll be fine uh, with the Jewish community. I think he has, uh, you know, strong ties in the Bronx. And, uh, he does, huh? you know, yeah. I think he's, um, he, he knows the Jewish community. He knows, uh, you know, obviously uh, he's going to have an education in a lot of different communities, uh, being elevated to speaker and, and for the first time uh, being involved in that position. But, uh, you know, I served with him for five years uh, in the assembly. I, I worked with him when I was in the city council and he was up here in Albany. And uh, we did a number of uh, things together. Uh, he's a like good listener, which is a very well, important quality. We hear he's quiet. He's <laughs> quiet. Uh, but then again, so is Shelley Silver, and, and so is my father in his own way, in their own ways. Uh, you know, they were good listeners also. So I think uh, he'll follow the uh, Shelley Silver uh, mm -hmm. tradition of, of listening and uh, you know advocating for his members. Now you mentioned your father, Saul Weprin. He was Speaker of the Assembly uh, before Shelley Silver. Before Shelley, and be, yeah, and in between Mel Miller and Shelley, he Correct. was right. Uh, did you ever think of in this uh, mix-up that was going on, and you know, they, they everyone was campaigning? Did you have any glimmer of thoughts that maybe, hey, maybe I could do this, uh, have another well, Whopper and a Speaker? You know, the uh, <laughs> you know, we have 106 Democrats in the House, and I think uh, you know each one of them thinks that they could be a good Speaker. I think, but. Uh, I think you have to look at the realistic, um, <laughs> you know, aspects of it. And uh, I was probably a little too junior. I mean, Call was actually the most junior of all the candidates that, th that threw their names out. But he had still been here 15 years. Uh, I've only been here five years, so, uh, you know. Well, but you got the name. <laughs> I do have the name, yes. <laughs> so there was, and, and did, 
Did you ever have a conversation with your wife about it? And, no, no, but there and, were a number of constituents. people say... People oh. have come over to me, a lot of constituents, a lot of people <laughs> in the political arena have said something you know, to me, but... Uh, I never asked you this, so that's yeah. why I thought I'd no, it have some fun with you. It with wasn't in the cards for this time. I, I supported Carl, and, and I think he'll be a good speaker. Okay. Um, what about the... Um, there's a... Oh, oh, yeah. You, you're the chair of the task force on people with disabilities. Correct. Why did you choose that, or did you not have a choice? So you just put on that? Did you request to be put on that? No, no. I, I was happy. I discussed it uh, with the former speaker, Sheldon Silver, where I got appointed. And, uh, you know, we had a couple of different options. And, uh, uh, you know, I've worked with um, uh, people with disabilities for many years, going back to when I was finance chair of the city council. I was very involved in, uh, in pro programmatic money. Uh, people with disabilities. I started the um, autism initiative in the city council where I got money every year in the budget, um, which was, you know, continuous for after school programs and summer programs um, for children on the uh, autism spectrum. Uh, I worked very closely with UJA at the time uh, in that and they kind of uh, spearheaded, uh, you know, some of that. And, and obviously there was a lot of um, involvement by uh, OHEL and a number of other Jewish groups. Uh, you know, who were involved in the um, autism community, and uh, we helped uh, get them funding uh, for various programs. So uh, it's, it's, it's an area that I've been involved in, uh, in for many years, and it's, it's an area that I'm, I feel I can really make a difference uh, with a very vulnerable uh, population. Uh, are you working with Phil Goldfeder because he's the chair of the subcommittee on autism retention? And yeah, we've actually done a lot together on, on, uh, on autism, absolutely. Yeah. So he says that they... He's going to try to have an autism, not just a disability awareness day, but an autism awareness day, something specific for autism this session. Uh, yeah, and is I think this we're the first you're hearing about no, it? No, no, no. We, we had a uh, meeting on it um, at the New York Family for Autistic Children. This was uh, sometime last year, and we've been working closely on arranging that, so we're, uh, we're going to be okay. working on it together. All right, good, good. Um, what and and did you want to be on this task force for any personal reasons at all or anything or uh, no my, my daughter has been very involved um in um, in working with uh, people in the dis disability community in the in the jewish community she's um she's worked at yachad uh, for a number of years she's uh, been a counselor uh working in summer camps and uh doing shabbatons for many years with yachad and she graduated uh, queen's college and um She's uh, thinking of applying to either medical school or physician assistant school, and she's working at Yachad as a fellow uh, for a year right now, uh, you know, working with special needs children in the, uh, in the Orthodox community. Uh, how, how much has ethics reform come up in conference, and uh, wh what's been going on with that? And do you feel the governor should be uh, subject to whatever ethics reforms he might want to have for the legislature? Well, yeah, I think it should apply to all state officials. I don't think it's just the governor. I think it should be all, you know, statewide elected officials. Uh, statewide elected, okay. Well, all, all state... Not well, commissioners. Well, we do have ethics rules in yeah. place. I think it's a question of, uh, you know, kind of um, looking at them and seeing whether they're, you know, they're sufficient. But, yeah, there, there definitely uh, should be uh, ethics rules applying to uh, commissioners and, and uh, senior level, you know, um, administration uh, staffers as well as uh, members of the legislature. So do you support what the, do you have any outside income? I do. And I, I'm an investment law? banker. Oh. I've been an investment banker for about 30 years. Um, you know, with, with Would this impact firms. your? Well, I think right now we're talking about disclosure. If we we're going to make the legislature full time, I think there'd have to be a salary increase. I think there'd also have to be a change uh, in the legislative calendar. Right now you have a legislative calendar uh, from January to June. And the idea is that, you know, we're, people's legislature and you should be able to have other occupations, other professions. I think um, there's a lot the legislature benefits from uh, from people of different professions. We have a number of pharmacists, we have uh, mm -hmm. uh, we have one... Um, healthcare professional. We have a number of healthcare professionals, yeah. uh, including... Um, John McDonald is a pharmacist. Yeah. We have quite a few. We have farmers right. uh, and we have um, you know people in the collection business. We have a lot of lawyers. <laughs> Um, we have a couple of doctors, um, so we and do. And you got a federal prosecutor now. And we have a former, former, federal, former prosecutor. federal prosecutor. <laughs> so, Todd uh, Kaminsky. Yeah. So absolutely. So I, I think there's a benefit, uh, you know, to the legislature that they can okay. bring from their uh, from their personal experiences. Um, but I, uh, when I first started in the city council, and also before I started in the assembly, 
I got an ethics opinion um, from the uh, you know, ethics commission uh, at the state level and the New York City Conflicts of Interest Board basically giving me guidelines, uh, strict guidelines about uh, where I can uh, do business and I don't do uh, any, um, you know, bond issues or any, um, you know, financial, um, you know, business with any New York State agencies. I'm very careful about that. I do a lot of work in New Jersey and Connecticut and Pennsylvania and, and other places. Uh, so, um, you know, as long as you have disclosure, you have, uh, you avoid any potential conflicts of interest, you know, right now we're still considered a part-time legislature. If we were going to make it a full-time legislature, obviously, uh, you know, I would, uh, I would go along with that. Well, would you be, uh, you said that, you know, when you're an investment banker, you might have, you're trying to avoid conflicts of interest, but something might come up when you already have a client that you've had for many, de for decades, but all of a sudden has business before the state that, unbeknownst to you, or you couldn't possibly know what was going to happen in the future, Should, you, know, you shouldn't be penalized for that. No, no, as long as you have full disclosure. And um, I have abstained on a number of bills where I thought um, you know, there might be an issue. So it's, it's not uncommon uh, to abstain, you know, if, just to avoid the appearance of uh, conflict of interest. Even if it isn't a direct conflict, uh, it could be a potential conflict. And, and I have abstained on a number of pieces of legislation for that reason, well, that's uh, good. both in committee and on, and on the floor. They should hold you up as an example of what to do. <laughs> because I uh, have a list here of uh, 43 uh, legislative bad apples who got into trouble since uh, <laughs> so for the past few decades. So, really? Yeah, so I, I yeah, I'll of give the you the Assembly this. in the Senate? Or, yes, uh, yes. Uh, what are they? Uh, 28 in the Assembly and 19 in the Senate. Well, do you think that <laughs> would maybe um, relieve the problem? Because if they'd be full time, I mean, you know, there's no excuse for doing something wrong, of course. But if you'd say, hey, here's a normal full time salary, you don't have to look for outside interests or bribes or whatever have you. I mean, maybe that would alleviate the problem. Well, look, there's always the argument that um, there's something to be said. Uh, that somebody doesn't necessarily rely only on their legislative salary to support their family, because then you it might you might make certain decisions because you're worried about potentially losing an election, uh, as opposed because you you know you need that um, income, you know to support your family, and and you might do something you might not otherwise do uh, because you're worried about preserving that job as opposed to having a, a profession a career uh, that you could fall back on. So I, I could make that argument as well. And if you're going to do something illegal, you could do something illegal. You know whether it's uh, a full-time job or a part-time job. Right. Either way, mm -hmm. that's what the governor said. But now you know they brought up at, the, at a news conference. Uh, they said, Governor, you know, you, what about your book disclosure? And he says, Well, wait. You know, he disclosed what he had to up to this point. He says, Wait till next year, and you'll and hang around next year, and you'll see what the rest of it is. And uh, they said, Well, isn't that is that the way you really want to? Act and to you know to have that uh, you know thing. well he just didn't see it as a problem and he said he said you know the publisher Harper Collins is owned by News Corp and one of the, so, someone from the audience said well why don't you you know News Corp was lobbying the legislature and your office and the executive chamber for certain thing online tax relief or something and he said well I didn't know about that I have no idea who came or what and. You know, I don't know. I don't know. It's like Sergeant Schultz. You know, <laughs> so not, not exactly. <laughs> so I'm just saying that's what that's the governor. Until he knows, he doesn't know. Right. <laughs> he doesn't know what he does. So anyway, um, what's your uh, what, so what's going on in the legislature coming up this year that you see is going to be a high? Uh, you know, aside from after the budget. You know, aside from ethics. Aside from education, you know, what do you see is going to be, a, or is it going to be a dull session that we had off, off well, already, a lot of excitement? Well, you already had a lot of excitement you know. uh, that wasn't necessarily uh, contemplated. <laughs> now, look, the budget is an important part of the process, and, uh, you know, there's still a number of issues uh, to be resolved with the budget, and we're hoping we'll have a budget uh, by April 1st. Uh, you know, but there are other issues, um, you know, uh, outside the budget, and, you know, the, the DREAM Act is one. Um, you know, there's there's a number of other issues, and uh, you know we'll we'll be you know taking them up. I have my own pet uh, bill that I've been involved in. Um, I don't know if I discussed it last time. No, we call it, it the uh, Adoptee Bill of Rights. 
We actually now have nine, 90 out of 150 sponsors, bipartisan support, uh, which would basically allow uh, an adult uh, adoptee, when they become 18 years of age, uh, to apply for a copy of their original birth certificate, oh. which is maintained at the local uh, health department uh, in the local counties in New York State. And that is actually sealed uh, by law, uh, I think since like, you know, 1938, uh, sealed um, at the health department. Uh, and I think part of the reason behind it was uh, to protect the, uh, often the birth mother who often gave up a child as a teenager for adoption uh, at a wedlock and you're protecting that identity. But um, today, I don't know if that's nece necessary anymore because we have the internet, we have private investigators and uh, adoptees uh, who have assets, who have money, uh, can hire private detect detectives and find out you know, who their birth parents are. Uh, and I think in states that have adopted similar legislation to allow adoptees uh, access to the original birth certificate. Well, for uh, health reasons. I mean, there, there a lot might of health be reasons. hereditary Right, issues. and uh, we had somebody at a press conference I had who basically said she's, um, she hired a private investigator, she found out who her birth parents, and she found out she was Jewish, that her mother was Jewish, really? and she had no idea. She grew up Irish, and she Irish Catholic, and she had no clue that she had any uh, Jewish heritage at all. And she actually found that out uh, because of the uh, you know, private investigator, but that's something that would uh, be evident uh, on the birth certificate, uh, as well as uh, there was another woman um, She's been public about it, so I'll mention her name, a Jewish woman, uh, Jill Auerbach uh, from Poughkeepsie, New York. And um, she uh, gave up a child for adoption uh, when she was 17. And she later found out, and she actually later remarried the, uh, the father of the child. Uh, and then she found out uh, that um, the father died of a heart attack uh, when, he was in his uh, when he was about 40. And his grandfather, uh, his father and grandfather had also died of a massive heart attack uh, when they were in their 40s. And his, her son that she gave birth to, a uh, biological son, was approaching the age of 40, so she made it a crusade to find him, to get him uh, the medical knowledge of his family history, which he would have no reason to believe as a healthy 40-year-old, uh, that he had this genetic uh, you know, tendency uh, for heart problems, and she did locate him, and she may have actually saved his life. But this is information that could be obtained uh, through uh, finding a birth certificate, plus their uh, adoptees feel that it's part of their DNA, that it's part of their, uh, their life, and um, you know, why should they have less civil rights uh, than any other citizen in New York State just because they happen to be adopted uh, through no fault of their own? They had no control over that, and we're only talking about adults now. We're not talking about protecting children. We have a lot of legislation on the books to protect children, uh, but here we're talking about adults that are making a conscious decision to apply and, and obtain their original birth certificate. Well, if there's 90 co-sponsors, why isn't it passed now? Oh, that's another question. That's part of the well, thing we're discussing with the... Uh, is it the Senate? Who's written? opposing it? The health yeah, department? Um, well, no. Governor's there's office? There's uh, some uh, legislative staff. There are a number of... Uh, surrogate, the Surrogate Judges Association have opposed it because uh, they feel it uh, takes away uh, discretion from the... Uh, from the judiciary, from uh, making that decision, because right now under the law you can't apply, uh, you know, uh, case by case to uh, to get your birth certificate for medical reasons. But the anecdotal evidence has been uh, that uh, very few judges will grant, uh, you know, access to the original birth certificate. And uh, you know, I think it's an archaic law that doesn't necessarily exist. And uh, you know, people, uh, there's a, a huge movement, uh, and there's been a number of movies. Uh, that have been out, uh, you know, basically showing uh, how important it is for, um, you know... Well, Jewish identity, I actually had, I mean, a few out. cases, but one case was very, very frustrating, right up your line, and um, he, a person came to me and he said, well, he knew was her, he's adopted, but his parents were Jewish. So I went to head rabbis, I mean, I'm a rabbi, but, you know, this is a big call to decide someone's Jewish or not. And they said, well, we need more evidence than just someone saying they're Jewish on a, you know, who are their parents. So he went to court and they denied him. And I says, I can't do anything about it. You know, that, you know, I can't make you Jewish unless, you know, the criteria is in. So it was very frustrating, obviously, for him, to say the least. And for me, I wanted to help him. But, you know, your bill would help the situation there. Right. And, a lot, and uh, he might have trouble being married, uh, you know, by an Orthodox rabbi for that reason. And... Uh yeah. Has anyone brought up the idea in this day and age when there's so much mental illness that if someone found out who their biological parents were, that they would be so 
uh, upset with their parents for doing this that they'd go after them to try to, you know, sort of take uh, revenge or something? Yeah, I think you're talking about you know, a crazy case, you know. Um, well, that's exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, but that could happen, <laughs> that illness, could happen yeah. with or without whether some adult had access to the original birth certificate. Look, there are always going to be cases. The other argument against it was that, you know, you're afraid that when somebody becomes 18, they'll show up in the doorstep of their biological parents uh, who don't want to have any contact. But my, but my bill actually provides for a form uh, and to contact the birth parents and have them opt to be contacted uh, directly, indirectly, uh, or through an intermediary or have no contact at all as part of the request uh, for the original birth certificate. And in states that have adopted similar legislation, anecdotally, uh, overwhelmingly, uh, birth parents have opted uh, for contact uh, with their biological children. Hmm. So uh, when you said this was a pet legislation and you didn't talk about adoption, I thought you were talking about pet adoption. No. <laughs> <I thought you're laughs> gonna, because there's something, you know, there's Pet Advocacy Day, and there's a lot of legislators who have their That's pooches no, that no, they come with. The it's <laughs> adult adoptee uh, advocacy. So and, I thought, well, uh, yeah. we're going to get and, something. And they look at it as a human rights yeah. issue, as I do, that um, <laughs> why should anybody... Uh, you know, not have access to something that uh, is, 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 a, is a public document, uh, but really um, the only one who really has any emotional interest to that document is the actual adoptee themselves, and they're the only ones that don't have access to that document. Are you a lawyer by profession? I am. Oh, you are, so that's why, and the, so the Judiciary Committee and Codes Committee really get you, get your juices flowing, huh? That juice is flowing, <laughs> so, you know, I have some, you know, a legal background to kind of... Uh, add value in, in those committees. Right, right. I just wanted to make sure that, <laughs> that was, there was a connection there. And, and then banking, because you said you're investment bankers. So and I was also a deputy superintendent of banking under Governor Cuomo. That's right. So you have that. And then the city's... Mario Cuomo. Right. Uh, then the city's committee. Correct. So because you live in the largest city in the world. No. <laughs> well, you know, it's, <laughs> it's a committee that deals with, we had a hearing today the, uh, when the mayor testified, yes. Mayor de Blasio, yes. you know, the joint budget hearing, I'm on Ways and Means, but I'm also on Cities, and that was a, a joint hearing. There. I right. can testify to that. <laughs> mm -hmm. right. uh, election law, do you have a special penchant for election law? I mean, Other than the fact that I've run for office, office. <laughs> uh, a number of times, I ran uh, city council uh Because we have one of the most arcane times. election laws in the country. Why do you right? say? Well, because when you circulate petitions, for example, you know, there's certain restrictions, and if you just do something a little bit wrong, it could be challenged and then it could be thrown out. I mean, I've seen such, you know, crazy cases where people had the right intention, but yet the judge ruled that the signature, there weren't enough the signatures, you know. Well, we have made it easier over the years, uh, you know, to get on the ballot. We've reduced the number of signatures. Uh, there are a number of states where you can just kind of declare your candidacy and get on the ballot. Yeah. You don't have to go through such a, a rigorous procedure as New York State does. Right. Uh, we've also um, had proposals for um, you know, uh, voting over a number of days, making it easier yeah. uh, to register to vote. Uh, you know, there are a lot of, well, I think I we're heading in the direction. Of, I remember Governor Mario Cuomo saying, you know, why do we only have election day on one day? Why can't we have a mobile voting booth that drives around the state and comes to your block and, you know, you can vote, come out of your house and vote and then go back in and, you know, make it easier for the people, bring the voting booth to the people. And he's, you know, he was like, you know, why if it snows, in the North Country on Election Day, and no one comes out, that they should be deprived of a vote, you know, a vote. Yeah, we definitely so. should make it easier. And also, it's, um, it's abysmal that uh, we have such a low percentage of registered voters actually coming out to vote, right. uh, whether it be at the New York City level, the state level, or the federal level. Right. I mean, that we, uh, we as a country uh, have a much lower percentage uh, of uh, registered voters and, and registered voters actually voting uh, than many, many other countries. Uh, they're they're I, heavy with I the government, though. Right? I can't yeah. imagine that you've ever missed a vote, an election. Um, I, I can't remember any vote I've missed. <laughs> okay. All right. Since Listen, David, they, you're doing a great job, and keep up the good work, and uh, Thank you, have Rabbi. a good session, and do it with good health. Yes, much Thank success. You. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, Mark.